Okay, so now I come to my conclusion, uh, which is, uh, I think, the most relevant section of this entire lecture, and that is power. I'm not talking here about political power, I'm talking about electricity. <laughs> now, um, power is the most fundamental and important aspect of the industrialization of, and modernization of any country. It is so important, in fact, that uh, Vladimir Lenin, the leader of uh, the Russian Revolution, once stated that socialism is nothing but Soviet power plus electrification. If we have workers' power and we have bijli everywhere, that's socialism. And that's how central he thought power was. And really, it is. Because there's nothing in the country that can run without power. You know that when there is a power outage of 12 hours or 16 hours, the whole country, whatever it is that you're doing, whether you're studying or whether you are producing cotton or whether you are running, a, 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 what do you call it, a, a water pump uh, for agriculture, everything across the economy is going to stop for the six hours in which there is no power. And we have experienced a situation where in Pakistan where power, we've had gone without power for 12 hours, sometimes for 16 hours. In some villages, there is no power for like days on end. Um, and we've been facing this throughout. So what is the reason? Well, first of all, let's look at some data. Uh, two to 3% of GDP is lost every year because of power shortages. That means if Imran Khan is growing at two point, not Imran Khan, Imran Khan is, if the economy under Imran Khan is growing at 2.4%, if you solve the problem of power, you can easily re reach 5 or 6% just by solving one problem, the problem of power. Uh, in 2011-12, the situation was so bad that this was up to 3 to 4% of GDP. That means if the economy is growing at 4% and power is solved, then you end up growing at 8%. That's like a Chinese rate of growth. That's really, really high. That's how central power really is. Uh, Asian Development Bank says the cost of power generation, the country has escalated almost 40% in the two fiscal years ending in 2012. So every time the cost of power is escalating, all costs across the economy, everything is becoming 40% more expensive. Why is this happening? The absence of energy, Asian Development Bank again says, is the main constraint for economic growth in Pakistan. You couldn't be clearer than that. That's the main problem you, you folks are having. There's no power to run anything. The ongoing energy crisis, says Berkey, has crippled Pakistan's industry and economy. A conservative estimate puts the loss to industry at 13% of total manufacturing sales. Right? That is, I don't need to tell you, massive. So what's the reason? If you listen to mainstream economists, not all economists, but mainstream economists, you listen to government, you listen to other people, they keep saying, you're not paying your electricity bills. You're using too much electricity and not paying your bills. That's the main reason for the slowdown. But I'm here to tell you a different story, a story that begins in 1994, where a new policy was set up, and this was the private power policy of 1994. This was a time period in Pakistan as well as in the world where because the Soviet Union had collapsed uh, and the Chicago school and neoliberalism and uh, all these folks had come to dominate, the mantra and the panacea for all economic woes and ills was said to be the market. Take away the government, bring in the market, everything will be hunky dory peachy everything will be fine and this is a worldwide thing this was a one shoe shoe size fits all solution so there's one solution that was given to over a hundred countries the same solution given to over a hundred countries applied across the globe in over a hundred countries and that was called neoliberalism bring the market in take the government out simple so 1994, this policy was passed. It was universally hailed by all the development institutions and all private financiers said, well done, Pakistan. The United States Secretary of Energy, Hazel O'Leary, described it as the, quote, best energy policy in the world. Pakistan, you were getting five out of five stars. US Congress also lauded O'Leary's mission and said, and I quote, Energy Secretary Hazel O'Leary has just returned from a highly successful mission to Pakistan, which has opened new doors 
not to you, but to American business leaders and may represent as well an important turning point in our diplomatic relations with Pakistan. Pakistan, you're on the right track. O'Leary was accompanied by 80 American business executives, primarily from the energy sector, Reed Oil, resulting in the signing of 16 contracts worth $4 billion. <laughs> And now if Imran Khan could say, I, I, I can get $4 billion of investment into Pakistan, people would be really happy, right? Because he, when he went to IMF, he got $6 billion and everybody, and this is 1994 we're talking about, so dollar prices are even higher, right? So everybody seemed very happy, but what happened? There was a gold rush for energy in Pakistan. Everybody, yes, Ayad, everybody wanted to come to Pakistan and invest in guess what? Energy production. <laughs> Not gold, energy was the gold, right? And you got what we call independent power producers. So before this 1994 policy, where did you get power? You got it from VAPTA. And of course, we were running down VAPTA, inefficient, corrupt, horrible people, political, overstaffed, yevo, flana, flana. We're totally running it down all the time, etc. And now we were gonna do privatization, we're gonna have an independent power producers, and everything was gonna be back on track. It was based on the Hapco project, et cetera. What was the project? So the project was a bulk tariff of US cents, 6.5 per kilowatt for the sale of electricity to VAPTA. So VAPTA was going to buy electricity from independent power producers at a fixed rate of dollars 6.5 per kilowatt. Let's be, you gotta understand these terms and conditions because as they say, the devil is always in the details. If you don't understand the details, you don't understand how this works. So investors in turn were to be provided a dollar-based internal rate of return of 15 to 18% over a 25 to 30 year period of the power purchase agreement. This is like a guaranteed profit. We're going to buy this much electricity from you. You're going to make at least this much profit uh, in, over the next three decades. IPPs will be paid every month in two different parts, capacity payment and energy payment. What is capacity payment? Capacity is the payment we give them for creating that capacity, which means reimbursing IPPs for all fixed costs of power plant, including debt servicing. This was on an 80 to 20 percent ratio and provided uh, investors with equity returns on top of that. This means that VAPDA, PEPCO, KESC, Karachi Electric Supply Corporation, became contractually liable for repaying the debt and its interest payments taken uh, which was financing 80%, and they, hence they were financing 80% of the project costs anyway. VAPDA, PEPCO, etc., are paying 80% of the project costs of the IPPs, and they are contractually obliged to pay this money. Yes, Hamza. But he, they have gotten this. Uh, they have gotten the IPPs to come and build a plant, right? The VAPDA has to pay 80% of the money for that plant. Not hard to understand. If they've taken whatever, however they financed it, they have to pay for that plant over this, over this entire 25, 30 year period. So not to say, don't run ahead, listen. So energy payment, uh, so the second section was energy repayment. This is of course uh, all variable costs, which means fuel costs, oil costs. Whatever IPPs import in terms of fuel, etc., VAPTA has to pay for their supplies. Let me finish then ask the questions. So it was regardless of the type of fuel employed, where it was bought from, uh, what the market price was at which it was bought. Wherever the oil price goes, VAPTA has to pay. All payments were indexed with a US to Pakistan rupees exchange rate and inflation, whether local or foreign changes, was to be accounted for, to, was to be fixed. Hence, if the Pakistani rupee devalued, you still had to pay the, uh, you had to pay in dollar prices still, and at the fixed prices at 1994 rates. So if the dollar also went, uh, its value went down, you still had to pay the dollar price of the value of 1994 dollar price, and if the rupee sadly devalued and went down, you still had to, you had to pay more and more money. So as the rupee lost, relative to the dollar, the bill, the oil bill, escalated in the same proportion. If the rupee lost by 10%, your oil prices went, you know, your oil bill went up by the same amount. That could not be changed. So, uh, and finally, if this wasn't bad enough, 
there was complete exemption of all IPPs from all corporate income taxes, from all custom duties, from all sales tax, and from all surcharges of any kind of imported equipment. Naturally then, uh, the people who wanted to invest were going to say things like you read here, that this is the best energy policy in the world. Because this, you're basically guaranteeing them, for three decades you're guaranteeing them uh, yes, as much money as anybody can possibly make. There's no way an investor can go wrong here. But what was the result of this? Uh, Vapda got stuck with massive overcapacity as well as debt. So they built the IPPs and surprisingly, you had more power than you required. You required about uh, 5,000 megawatts to 8,000 megawatts of power. The installed capacity actually exceeded that. So very soon into the 1990s, you had, believe it or not, Saad, you had excess production of electricity and no need to utilize it. But you still had to pay the money for the installation of that capacity. Uh, World Bank was, let me finish. World Bank was instrumental in promoting this policy. From the 1980s onwards, they basically, once the Cold War had ended, they basically said, we're not going to give you soft loans like we gave you a loan before to build Tarbela Dam, and we gave you a loan before to build other things. We're not going to do that anymore, okay? What we want instead is trade, not aid, they began to say. This became the big slogan, trade, not aid. Investment, not aid. You're also saying aid is so bad, etc. but aid wasn't half as bad as what was substituted in its place. So uh, World Bank was involved with 88% of the total IPP capacity contracted, etc., which is 3,400 megawatts through equity loans and other guarantees. They facilitated ideologically as well as financially this entire deal. Now, since 1990, as a result of this policy, the cost of electricity has climbed by 530%. Well done, folks. The energy mix has shifted from producing electricity with water to producing electricity with oil and gas. I'll finish and then I'll take questions. So hydropower is over, oil power is in. And this has, of course, exposed Pakistan to fluctuations in the prices of international prices of oil. 70% of uh, now Pakistan's power generation is occurring on the basis of oil-fueled thermal units uh, and so on, which are of lower efficiency and more costly to produce electricity through oil than it is to produce electricity electricity through water. Of course, then this was accompanied by a huge campaign about how dams were environmentally horrible, forgetting about how oil utilization was even worse. Akmal Hussain writes, the core of the power crisis lies in three facts. Number one, as much as 82% of total electricity production is now oil-based when oil prices are astronomically rising. By contrast, a decade ago, only 50% of electricity output was fuel-based, with the remaining 50% coming from cheaper hydroelectric power. Huge change in the structure and the way in which you produce electricity. Consequently, the average cost of electricity has become so high that the government simply does not have the fiscal capacity to provide the subsidy necessary to supply electricity at a price which most consumers can afford. Indeed, increasing oil-based electricity would involve doubling the price of the additional supply. So you switched from water to oil, prices have gone up, to put it simply. Number two, a related problem is billions of rupees of unpaid electricity bills by provincial governments, semi-autonomous corporations, and federal government departments. The recovery of the shortfall prevents the government from paying its dues to the IPPs, who are then forced to cut back production. So government is unable to pay the bills, the bills are going high, they are not able to pay the bills. If they're not able to pay the bills, then the, when the bills are not paid, they say, okay, fine, we're not supplying the electricity. Shut it down. An institutional weakness combined with obsolete transmission technology means also power losses along the way. So that is the, the scenario right now. And Pakistan has plunged into darkness thanks to the privatization policy and the IPP policy. Excess capacity together with high energy prices. Uh, six power plants remain shut. Hubco, Capco are producing at half their capacity. We have capacity. We're not producing because we can't afford to pay for it. 15 grid stations are not working. At the same time, you have load shedding because of circular debt. What is that? You're not being able to pay the bills. Because the way you set up the bill structure, how could you pay that? You know, when you said, oh, 94 dollar prices, we're going to fix it or peg it to that. 
and pay, you know, pay according to that, and that's never going to change where, no matter what oil prices do, no matter what happens to the rupee. What, if the rupee devalues from 128 to 160 rupees per dollar, what happens to power production? We can't pay for it. And if we can't pay for it, we have to go begging to the IMF for money to pay for the IPPs. Otherwise, there's going to be load shedding. If there's load shedding, what happens? The economy shuts down. So destruction of foreign exchange. Why don't we have foreign exchange? Because we're using all that money to buy oil. Why are we buying so much oil? Because we're using that money to pay for electricity production to run the economy. And complete slowdown of all economic production in Pakistan. What do government people keep telling you? It's your fault. It's not our fault that we made a bad contract. It's your fault, Abbas. You're not paying the bills. And you're stealing electricity. This is the real reason for pay your bills. The other thing is use less power. So electric savers, please start using them. Don't use the, the old bulbs. Turn off your lights. Why aren't you being responsible? Be good citizens. Turn the lights off. PM even says, well, we can save 700 megawatts of electricity just by, let's reduce the number of working days. Let's have more holidays. Sit at home. Just have a five. In fact, in Pakistan right now, we have a four-day work week. We don't even have a five-day work week. Nobody works on a Juma, right? They knock off after 12 o'clock. They come to their offices in the morning at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock. They knock off at 12 o'clock, if they come at all. You know this is the truth. And if anybody objects and says, get you know, back to work, they'll say, sir, Jumat al Mubarak. Hai. How can you say such a thing? Right? And then Sunday is off, Saturday becomes off, the whole Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You know, we are out doing New Zealand in terms of our work week. But the reason isn't. The reason isn't that we want you to have greater holidays. The reason is we can't run the plants. Because there's no electricity. Then they're saying, oh, we're going to, ex we're going to use the thar coal. Have you heard of that? Thar where there's no water. People are, you know, they don't have enough drinking water. We're going to have the coal from there. There's 175 billion tons of coal there. We're going to use the coal to run Pakistan's economy now. Remember those old steam engines where you throw the coal in? And that's what we're going to do to make electricity now. We're going to burn coal. The problem is the coal, the Pakistani coal, has a very high water content and low energy uh, output ratio. So you can burn all the coal, pollute the environment, and yet you won't get the output that you need, energy output that you need. We're going to go for solar and wind, and everybody's, oh, we've become so environmentalist and so on. The reason isn't that you become environmentalist. The reason is you made a bad deal. Now you're just trying to cover it up with all this other <laughs> nonsense talk about how I care about the environment. It's expensive. Per unit of electricity produced, solar power does not compare with water power. That is the fact of the case. Now, I'm not here arguing the case for Bhasha Dam, but water power, generally speaking, is way cheaper than other forms of energy. This is well known. So government is saying we're going to create new dams, we're going to create new IPPs, please, thank you. We're going to create a new nuclear power plants, we're going to get CPEC to come and solve it for us, we're going to get the Chinese, etc., etc. But every single time the problem is the same, government doesn't have financing, right? Why doesn't it have financing? Because it's paying the bills for oil. Why is it paying the bills for oil? Never mind, you know the story already. So privatization of power is the main reason for Pakistan's economic slowdown after the 1990s. This is the heart of the problem, not the trade unions, which are non-existent in Pakistan, not the fact that capital is afraid of investing in Pakistan, which is also not really true anymore because, I mean, in the 1980s, capital was investing in Pakistan throughout the Zia period, except, right? So what's the real reason? This is the real reason. And it's right there in front of you. Every day you lose power and you, you, you know it, right? And the, the, the reason, the failure is not a, uh, it's a failure of policy. It's the result of privatization and of neoliberalism, of inviting the market in at rates which are unsustainable. It's an unsustainable policy and an unsustainable contract. Um, so, uh, but you're still going on blaming the 1970s and blaming workers and so on and so forth, et cetera, et cetera. You're not ready yet to criticize and look at the real facts, which is neoliberalism, privatization, uh, and you can't fix Pakistan's economy, my friends, till you fix the problem of power, until you scrap the 1994 power policy uh, uh, and, and create a new and better power policy. <laughs>